if the course philosophy is indeed that the student is the center of of your goals, and so you're le you're thinking less about what you will teach and more about how they will learn, then that's going to frame all, all of the decisions you make pretty much after that. And so I think that I would start um, sharing how the classrooms that I've been in work in that way by talking about um, how it begins. So uh, the way any of our class uh, discussions begin really is with students having already done some things on their own. Um, to me, I think that's probably the crux of how I see the classroom um, is that that both the student and I are both coming together with information to share and to talk about. Um, in, a, in a more traditional design, I think sometimes students walk into the classroom and could literally say, what are we doing today? Because they wouldn't know. It would be you know, new, something that they would just be discovering in the moment. Whereas um, the philosophy that I, that I like is that a student would come to the table knowing what we'll do that day because they're already bringing a lot of that content with them. Um, and then our, our, therefore, our role really in the classroom changes a little bit from um, pure content delivery to discussion, application of that content, clarification of that content. Um, you can kind of go, you can use the class time therefore in a really different way. Um, so I would say that, that the first way that this course design bit is changed by philosophy is by how, do a, how does a student prepare ahead of time. Um, and we can talk more about that if you'd like. Um, but so all students will come to class prepared with some content. We'll use the class time, as I just discussed, as a chance for us to uh, apply, to clarify, to discuss. Um, and then when it gets to the evaluation or assessment component of it, um, that does also take a change with the course philosophy. Uh, clearly one of the jobs of the, the teacher is to, in the end, be able to say, this individual has learned this much, and therefore assessment is necessary. But I think that assessment can always serve a dual role, because anytime a student has a chance to check in with themselves and be assessed on their knowledge, they also have a chance to learn. Uh, but I think that the modality of your test and how you put that together might affect it. Um, and so one of the ways that I've tried to implement more of a learning approach versus a pure assessment approach is by having students repeat their exams Again, but with groups. So for example, in, in our anatomy class that I teach, uh, students would take at you know two midterms and a final, they take their individual exam that looks you know reasonably like other people's exams with some multiple choice and short answer, and they do that on their own first. There's also a little open book part um, that would give them a chance to deal less with memorization and more on application. But after they've done that individual portion, they've turned that in, then the next part of the exam is for them to start at the beginning of the GAN, go through all of the same exam questions, but this time do it with a group. Um, and my goal there is that they should never walk out of an exam um, and see a grade online, but never really have a chance to look at that exam again, understand where did they have difficulties, where did they not. Um, most students will come to me before the key is even up and tell me, oh, I know I did this well on an exam. And that's, and that's they haven't seen the answer key yet. This is purely from their discussions with other students. Um, and they'll come back to me and say, oh, I realized I didn't understand this, or I missed this concept. And so the goal is that before they actually are finished with the exam process, they already know as a self check-in, where did they go wrong? Where did they, um, or where did they miss a concept? Um, so that's that's a, a way to ensure that any exam is not just about, you know, assessing a student's knowledge from the outside, but from within, a student should understand what did they know, what did they not know. Why would you be less likely to fracture your ulna than the radius or the scaphoid when you fell on an outstretched arm? Right. Find that head of the ra of the ulna again and figure out where is it in relation to some of the other structures we've been helping. <laughs> what do you think? Does someone have something to share? Any ideas that came up? That's right. That's right. Give me an example of one structure we just palpated that would come in contact with the ground far before the ulna would. That's right. The pisiform, right? Remember we palpated this. If we, if we do this, we can. It really sticks out on the on the. Um, well, it's actually the medial side, but when I pronate, it looks like it's lateral, right? So that's going to come in contact far before. 
And is it a broad, is it a broad bone that, when it, it, that takes a lot of impact? Does it look like if you were a gymnast and you were going to be on your hands that you'd be doing a lot of weight bearing through the ulna or a lot of weight bearing through the radius? Right, the radius, right? It's the broad ending. 